Would you please check your ideas and opinions at the door? All your philosophical and religious views, all your logic, because I say check it at the door advisedly because you can pick it up again when you go out if you feel unsafe without it. I'm not trying to argue you out of your opinions and views. I'm merely suggesting that for the sake of an experiment, you temporarily suspend it. Hello and welcome to the Philosophical Minds Podcast, an exploration of all things philosophical, alchemical, and esoteric. From the psycho-spiritual to the material-chemical nature of the all. Join me and my guests as we inquire into the liminality of mind and matter, and tend to the fertile soils of awareness and perception, while facilitating an expanded consciousness from the individual to the collective. If you enjoy the show and find it of value, consider supporting and becoming a patron via the Patreon at patreon.com slash philosophicalminds. A small contribution makes a big difference and definitely makes it easier for me to continue the show. Although, I will always do my best to keep it flowing regardless. Thank you all, and let's get into it. All right, I am joined here today with Talal Al-Hamad, founder of the Urban Apothecary, board of director of the American Herbalist Guild, and he is a registered... Ex-board of director. (laughs) Ex-board of director, and uh, registered herbalist and therapist um how are you doing today uh how's everything going on your end not too bad man reporting in from the middle of the woods in ontario things are good life is good people don't bother me out here it's nice (laughs) ontario nice um and maybe you could just tell me and the listeners a little bit more about yourself and your background besides my my little intro there yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, I'll throw in a little bit about myself and answer the question that most people ask me, why did you become an herbalist or how? So, um, you know, my name is Talal, obviously. I am uh, born and raised in Kuwait. I've been in Canada about 21 years. Uh, um, I ventured into health and herbalism probably in my early 20s when I first moved here, essentially. Uh, within a year or two from moving from the Middle East to North America, especially after integrating into the food system here, I developed some very strange immune system issues and anaphylactic shocks, uh, allergy shocks to like various foods. Um, and so I um, was dissatisfied with the answer medical doctors were giving me, which is simply to look away. And, um, you know, that, that's essentially going to be my life sort of thing. Started, I started, you know, dabbling into eating a little bit better, finding some, some uh, refuge in supplements and that sort of thing. Um, and somehow within three to four years, I managed to correct said imbalance of a, a disease that would essentially have killed me. Um, I went back to the same me- medical doctor eating a banana, which was one of the items that would have killed me. And he just looked at me and he said, you should go do whatever you did for a living like that. This is crazy. So I said, OK, cool. And, and that, that's where it essentially kicked started what was once a glorified hobby um, that I'm now essentially a professional at. I started out with. I have explored almost all of the uh, holistic fields per se, and I, I've settled in what I thought w- I would be best at and what I'm most comfortable at. But, you know, I failed at homeopathy, essentially. Uh, I, I, I've done quite a bit in Ayurveda, which I integrate into my current work. Um, the Islamic and Unani section came much later with, you know, a lot of self-teaching because I can just read the Arabic text, basically. Um, but, I mean, the big, the big fork for me, I'd say, was when... I essentially was about to be a naturopath and then just before hopping into that kind of path i i said to myself let me just take a look at this herbal medicine it looks really cute um and uh, you know I, was, I just figured i'd be learning some nice teas in a couple of cells and within a few days i was just floored by medical efficiency accessibility and the empowerment you can get back that way so that's when i kind of just pulled the plug on naturopathy and and that was it. I just became an, an herbalist ever since. I focused on that path and growing in, in as many ways as I can, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think it's super cool having you as a guest too, because you bring like a really unique perspective in terms of your just your whole background, especially with the ability to read Arabic too, because obviously so many of these old alchemical texts are in Arabic and a lot of which haven't been translated. Um, so yeah. for you to be able to be out there and, uh, potentially bridging that gap is 
freaking awesome in my opinion and um yeah i'm sure we'll get yeah, thank into thank you yeah that that was the main goal right to try to how could i give back the most to this community and that would be to go back into my arabic text and as an herbalist lock myself basically in the vegetable realm where i could go into extremes perhaps that have not been explored so that's yeah i think the best way to see it yeah okay and you're obviously uh breaking some ground due to your recent posts on your instagram with um your like gem work and whatnot so maybe we'll talk about that yeah but... it's been it's been pretty fun it's been pretty fun yeah yeah i i do want to ask i think it's fascinating just because that whole area like you're from kuwait originally like that what is, i think yeah. it's near like iraq and all the ancient history yeah, around pretty much, that yeah. area it's super awesome i wonder um how much of your life did you get to spend there and were you ever ever able to explore like any uh unique uh architectural sites or maybe historical places there kind of a side tangent but i'm just curious yeah yeah no that's, that's a good question i mean so being born i i've had a bit of an interesting like upbringing per se like i've born and raised in kuwait per se but i've had quite a bit of extensive travels since i was a young age like by the time i was 14 i had seen almost like 30 nations at that point so my family made a good point to really expose me to culture and whether it be through food or language or yeah, our architecture and what have you. Um, it, it, it really created a very different kind of backdrop for me as an individual growing up. And that is why at a young age, I knew I couldn't just settle in the Middle East. I needed a lot more to advance what I wanted to do. What, and I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do at that point then. So um canada is an excellent setting for that especially with the lush forests of of this land and what have you like our yeah. botanical medicine is infinite here absolutely so i mm -hmm. i am aware that kind of a couple of your major focuses are i think primarily within your alchemical explorations is like the Al islamic and then uh unani medicine and i'm actually i don't know anything about uh unani medicine and very little about uh, Islamic alchemical texts or whatnot or anything in that regard. So maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, each one of those systems or traditions and uh, get into some of the yeah. details of like what you find interesting about. Yeah, yeah, them. yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so um, like before we get into that, I think it'd be really important to take note of an era, uh, the golden era of Islam, which I think a lot of folks were are familiar with to some extent, but. Um, it is really in, in that area where you can find most of humanity's recorded still to this day, I suppose, treasured knowledge. Um, this is essentially an era after the death of the prophet, where Arab leaders were called cali caliphs or caliphs in English. Um, Baghdad, modern day Baghdad, is essentially can be seen as the hub of what was the Abbasid Caliphate. Uh, the Essentially a group of, of people that uh, lived in the golden age of Islam in Baghdad, and they had uh, an absolute, almost like maniacal thirst for knowledge. It was it was unlike anything ever seen in time. There was a demand for doctors and a shortage of doctors at that time, and they were basically grabbing knowledge from everywhere and piling it as much as they can. They they actually established what was called the House of Wisdom back then, a, a space dedicated for scholarship and knowledge. I think it was about eight. 13 something to, to like 850 in that kind of region of and and it's such a it's such a beautiful synergy to see in that house because they recruited famous folks from Judaism Islam Christianity everybody kind of was sanctioned under the umbrella of knowledge there um and that particular movement started what was called the translation movement which brought most of the scholarly Greek works and Syriac texts and, and even stuff from the Hindu works out into basically uh, scripts. So a very, very important era, right? And it is during that area where um, because of the Quran's emphasis on learning, there was almost like a holy, it, it was seen as a holy activity. One of the principal um, pillars of Islamic learning or just being a Muslim is you must use your brain adequately, otherwise you are you know sinful so to speak so they really were trying to like play on that and uh that's when you have the the canon of medicine came out by by uh, ibn sina or avicenna which we'll discuss a little bit today uh, you had uh, al khawarizmi you had the uh, the invention of algebra you had a whole bunch of stuff coming out there so just something to take note of if anyone's looking for 
a, a good era to look at and perhaps discover a lot of texts that have not been popped out yet in English, but they're, they're, some are in Latin and German. Look at the golden era, right? Yeah. You find a and lot of information there. Just out of curiosity, when the golden era of Islam, what like time frame mm -hmm. are we looking at here? I mean, it's generally um, seven. It's 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 quite debatable, actually. They go from seven hundred CE to like so some folks would say to like the thirteenth or fourteenth century. Some folks would say to the tenth. It's actually quite debatable. Yeah. Um, I'm not I I I I'm not historically scholarly enough to like give an appropriate opinion. But yeah, it's kind of all over the map to be honest. Yeah. A few hundred years, definitely no a few hundred years, Just if not great. thousands. Yeah. I've yeah. Always, yeah. I've always loved. Uh... You know, when I was a kid, I loved uh, like Aladdin, like the Arabian Nights and all of that. I right, know. It's right. just the mysterious nature of, I think that story kind of derives from that text, the one, 1001 Arabian Nights. And it some of the right. characters in there and locations are based on real locations. I don't know a whole lot about it. I haven't read it or anything, but I always felt like there's, right. there's some, some truth or some little bits of interesting information within that story. And I always kind of gravitated yeah. towards that. Um, so I just there find is that... actually quite a bit of factuality in it, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and like a lot of yeah. the names, which I think, um, obviously throughout history, there there are so many like familial names that are repeated, and they, you know, like there's so many Muhammads, there's so many uh, Abu yeah. is one. Like you see, yeah. like a lot of that. Um, but yeah. I just I remember yeah, yeah. digging through and trying to research it, and I just found it so fascinating. But um, it yeah. is no, it is it is <laughs> definitely. So yeah, Abu, you'll find it to be common because that means father of. So you'll you'll see that all over the map. If oh, if okay, you. yeah, that's interesting. You probably know a lot. Yeah, generally so much speaking, about all that. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say you probably know so much interesting uh, pieces of information about that just with your by virtue of you being aware of like Arabic and all of that. So pretty much, yeah. Anything that comes to mind, idea. feel free to to spit out because it's just all interesting to me. Um, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, I will yeah. try. <laughs> so okay, maybe we can jump into a little bit of the Islamic side of things. And yeah, let's talk about that. So um, here's where it gets a little bit interesting. I think I'm pretty sure one of the first person in the West to talk about it and really disseminate because for the for the longest time, at least when I started teaching about these subjects. Most folks thought Islamic history was Unani history. Um, Islamic medicine was Unani medicine, and they're quite significantly different. And here's where I'd like to interject. So I'll talk about Islamic first. Islamic medicine to me is more the people's medicine, whilst Unani can be seen more for like secular elite, especially at the time where they were both out at the same time. So if we investigate the word Islam or Muslim in general, the root of the word, it means to submit to God and live in peace with nature. So that second half of the equation is where a lot of modern day Muslims have just kind of missed the point. They're focusing just on that first half. We're focusing more on what's called surface level or uh, uh, overt Islam, if you will, as opposed to covert, where the spiritual, the spiritual elements of it have just been disregarded. So and it's interesting to see because the, there's a lot of references in the Quran and the religion itself where they talk about how God entrusted man with nature and you must live in harmony with it. There's a quote from the prophet that says, the world is beautiful and green, uh, verily Allah made you its guardians and uh, uh, learn and, and be one with nature. So it, it's it's the, the, the references towards nature and, and the harmony, harmony with it are, you know, undoubted. Um, and the, the, even with the way they were talking about nature, they were talking about, do not exploit it as too much, honor it, preserve it, um, essentially talking about poaching and, and, you know, endangered plants, essentially in my eyes and what have you, respecting, uh, ecological, uh, fortitude, so to speak. And that's something to take note of, especially in today's modern day world, where most folks tend to have the concept of the grass is greener on the other side, exotic is better, importing herbs from, you know, the ends of the earth uh, is the way to go when the, in reality, it's what's around us that sh we should be focusing on. So um, it's just kind of interesting to see that kind of in, uh, intertwined within this so long ago, right? And um, 
I think one of the key things to recognize about Islamic medicine is the Prophet Muhammad was essentially, and I don't even think most Muslims recognize this, he was essentially a very good herbalist. Yes, he did the whole fasting and hallucinations in the cave and what have you, and he was illiterate, but he was an herbalist. He was prescribing herbal medicine and remedies and various concoctions and decoctions for acute and chronic ailments with clinical efficacy. That's where I'm seeing a lot of his text that there's um, things in Islam called hadiths, which pretty much means a uh, topic of discussion that the prophet was talking about. Um, and um, yeah, it, a lot of them were basically like recipes and that you can clinically use today in practice to cure a, a whole a variety of ailments. Uh, many may be even absolutely bizarre from the use of like urine to like, you know, various uh, herbal uh, concoctions that seem like they wouldn't fit together. So um, it's pretty, pretty interesting. You know, wow. one of my favorite things I've actually picked up from Islamic medicine, and it's, it seems so basic, is, um, and this is something I talk about for an hour at least, but the use of honey, medicinal honey within Islamic medicinal culture is like un un unlike anything else you'll see in any other culture. Um, and one cool thing we do is we'll take a teaspoon of honey and we will dissolve it in a glass of room temperature water. And that is how it's administered to the person. It is said that the entire glass would would take on the virtues of honey. It's as if you drunk a glass of honey without all that sugar and what have you. So it doesn't dilute it. It multiplies it out. Wow. Uh, it's a very interesting concept that we work with in alchemy as well, right? So, um, yeah. Yeah, so it's uh, just one of these examples. But uh, the, the prophet himself, he warned of the, da the dangers of mainstream allopathic medicine, actually. He did talk about that. Uh, he didn't ban it, but he did warn against its dangers. So uh, to me, that's almost uh, a signal or um, almost like a roundabout way of saying focus on root cause and, and, and not so much symptomatic, which is, again, something I find very uh critical in at least my style of East meets West herbalism, where I try to, you know, focus on ripping out the root of said ailments as opposed to symptomatic relief, um, which to be quite honest, generally the pharmaceuticals are superior at, right? Uh, so, um, yeah. Yeah, I think- And then, um, I yeah, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, I, th I think it, it's, it's so interesting. So many people, well, at least out here in the West, they're so, Quran hesitant or skeptical uh, or Muhammad skeptical, you know, just yeah. about things that have to do with historical religious wars and whatnot. And, but I find all this very interesting and informative and it's probably, you know, yeah. just due largely to the fact that in the West we're very like Judeo Christian dominated world. And that's kind of the foundation. Yeah. So a lot of people are probably yeah. just geared towards avoiding learning about a lot of this in information. Um, so is there, in the Quran, is there actually different recipes within it itself? Or are these kind of like side texts or books that are related to uh, Islam or? Yeah, Islam? both, both. Yeah. It's, it's interesting you mentioned that. I, as an adult now, I, I see the Quran, especially with what I know today, I see the Quran in a very different light. Um, it's a textbook of various, it's almost like an occult textbook. It does have a lot of religious significance, but it does have a lot of somewhat recipes and 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 things to, uh, actions to take rather and what's really interesting on the quran and this is something i've been trying to understand i don't fully understand it yet and, I, and nobody in the middle east really understand this the more i've asked about it the more i've seen it to be just like a write-off area but there is as, as everyone knows the quran similar to the torah and the, the bible has very uh has chapters uh, what are called surahs basically um and various chapters, I'd say 5% of the Quran or something like that, at the very start have a, a combination of three letters from the Arabic language that have no real coherent meaning and no, they don't really fit together that way. And if I can give you an English example, it's almost like putting the letter P, uh, Z, and Q back to back and making that to be a word at the start of a chapter. That's like a sentence, and then you start the book. You, you'd be like, what the hell is this? So there's a few of those, and they're called muqatta'at in Arabic, and that means the sliced up ones. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a bit of, uh, you you will take note of this in Sufi uh, scripts. They talk about this a little bit more. Uh, funny enough, the Germans are actually have quite a few books on this uh, um, in German, and there's one in English by Sobendorf where they talk about the 
uh, mysticism of, of Sufism and what have you. But what I'm trying to get at is there's some sort of like, I don't know what to, what to like, it's almost like a, a frequency that's, in my opinion, created by these strange sounds that put you into a state that prepare you for that particular chapter. And I'm not fully understanding how to apply this information yet. Um, but it's really interesting because it goes hand in hand with the knowledge we see in some of the occult Islamic textbooks, like the most famous one called Shams al-Ma'arif, which means son of knowledge by al Buni, considered by many to be the most dangerous book in the world, right? Um, he talks about that quite a bit in terms of utilizing various numerological numbering systems and what have you to kind of complement this. So it, it's quite fascinating. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it is fascinating because especially for someone who, who doesn't know, you know, just because of the language barrier and all of that, I, it makes me so curious to know, like, because I can dive through different occult uh, texts, you know, in English or whatever, yeah. but I'm sure there's just tons in Arabic that I would have no clue about. And maybe you've come across some interesting ones in your explorations that have Provided yeah, some... totally. I'll see if I can find this picture here. I've got, um, I have it on my Instagram recently, but this is an example of something I've translated into English recently. I don't think it's been done before, but this is the wheel that's found in Al Buni's book, Shams al Ma'arif, The Son of Knowledge. And it basically shows, it kind of goes that way, but it basically shows at the outer realm, like the 28 lunar mansions and then the 28 Arabic letters that are affiliated with them and the elements associated with the Arabic letters, seasons um uh, horoscope so it's it's quite bizarre so this is kind of the stuff I'm, I'm trying to bring forth right now into the western world and try to implement for me and more importantly into a clinical practice how can we apply this information and actually measure efficiency and not just feel cool about it this is yeah. really important to me right yeah yeah wow that's awesome mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned yeah, yeah, yeah. sufi and so sufism is kind of like a mystical islamic tradition is that right or am i yeah yeah i would say that yeah. is accurate it's it, it's seen in the middle east which is essentially the heartbeat of islam uh and they tend to see sufism as heretic and and what have you and it's very interesting to me because that's just pure ignorance if they if you look at the history of islam especially in the era when the mongols came and attacked and almost wiped out the religion it was the society within a society that came out and saved islam and what was that it was sufism the mm -hmm. hidden society within a society came right back out and pulled islam out from the dark ages and they had all the knowledge and they kept the occult stuff going and um, the mysticism so to speak so um yeah i would say it is it is islam it is actually to me a a, a a more viable uh, expression of it, and that is a lot more mutable. The other two expressions of Sunni and Shia are a lot more fixed. They're they're not able to, uh, they don't ad adhere to human psyche evolution, such as the Sufis believe. So it's it's really interesting to me. Yeah. And what is like what's the difference between Sunni and Shia? I think I knew that one time, but I forgot what that was. Well, it's essentially like, I mean, the Sunnis apparently uh, follow the. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad's tradition, so to speak, and then the Shiites uh, follow the uh, tradition of uh, the Imam or the priest named Ali, uh, who was, uh, I think, the cousin of, of the Prophet or something like that. So um, it's just a difference of opinion, like, uh, or schools of thought. But Shiites are much more uh, in line with, uh, much more in line with occultism and the uh, Sufism way of thinking. I would argue that the Sunni is a lot more uh, textbook, mm -hmm. a lot more five pillars, and and the occult and mysticism was largely erased. Yeah, it reminds me. So when I think of that, I think of like Christianity and Judaism, because Judaism is more Kabbalistic. You know, they got like the background with the Zohar and all of that. So it kind of seems like it's similar in that regard, maybe. Is there any sort, sort of like uh, Kabbalistic tradition? It, with any of these systems that you're aware of or no kabbalah is is more jewish based uh i i i'm pretty sure i mean judaism and its culture and what have you was around and developed before obviously the islamic era so there probably was some influence i wouldn't be surprised but i'm it seems to be quite distinct it just just looking at them both and what have you 
Um, I can't, I mean, I don't speak Hebrew, but I, I, in like an hour or two, I pretty much learned how to read most of it. Uh, it's, it's, it's much simpler in, in, at least for my eyes. And so, um, just kind of scrolling through the text, I couldn't find or see anything that was remotely similar, at least to me. So. Cool. Okay. So, uh, Unani, what about that word? Uh, what is like, what does it even mean or where does it come from? Yeah. Yeah. Let's get into it. So, um, just to kind of finish off on the Islamic medicine stuff. So when you look at Islamic medicine, pretty much most of the plants, the materia medica comes from the Quran or from hadiths or things the prophet kind of mentioned what's really cool about the islamic system is there's a lot less plants there's less than 100 probably um and a lot of them were free accessible and what have you and the the way this is what i really found to be really cool it was truly the people's medicine in in the sense that a lot of the plants their common name would tell you what it did so there was like, for example, 10 different wound herbs. And although they were all Latin, different types of plants and what have you, uh, the, the, the person at that point knew those 10 plants as wound herb and could apply it immediately simply by knowing its name. Uh, that was the beauty of this. There was immediate application, immediate empowerment. And that to me is very important when looking at a system, right? Definitely. Um, and so, um, yeah, it, essentially the one of the cooler things as well about islamic medicine which drives me to stay in the vegetable kingdom is that all diseases are stated to be cured within the vegetable realm if you haven't find it you haven't looked hard enough um and the arabic word for the word for drug actually especially in old arabic is aqar which means stub or shrub or seed really kind of just indicating to plants as as the um source of medicine right but it's very important to note that, and this is where Unani split off. Prophetic medicine or Islamic medicine had an equal value to um, knowledge of religion as well as knowledge of medicine. So in certain cases, various uh, certain diseases, the only treatment would be to read various chapters of the Quran or what have you. And I think that's where a lot more of the elite folks split off. They wanted a bit more, something a bit more scientific, so to speak, right? Yeah. Uh, and and there was no humoral theory obviously involved in any of the Islamic stuff and what have you. Um, that's essentially like the gist of it, if you will. Obviously, get into it a lot more. But um, yeah, the, the Unani system is essentially the birth child of uh, Ibn Sina or, or uh, 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 Avicenna, I think is what you folks call him in the West, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And. A little bit about Avicenna before we get into Unani medicine, because you have to understand what created it or who, like what this man was. The, we're talking about somebody born around like 980, you know, 80, something like that in Bukhara, Afghanistan at that time. Um, a prodigal, brilliant child uh, quotes were, were like, essentially, he exhausted all his teachers at a very early age. They were just fed up with him. Uh, at the age of 10, he was considered to be a half of. And what that means in Arabic is he who has memorized the Quran, which is extremely difficult to do, let alone at the age of 10 years old. That That is not normal to do that. Uh, Amazing. He conducted quite a, a lot of hardships, you know what I mean? Like political turmoil, wandered around. He had peace, He had refuge in like Persia under Prince Shams al-Dawla. Um, and he, his main resource to write his books was through memory, in which he wrote over 276 books in several volumes. Wow. I'm talking about books in absolute, and I'm talking about books as an expert in absolutely every single topic you can think of. I'm talking stuff like medicine, religion, physics, chemistry, horse riding, how to swim, how to fall, how to, which direction to sleep, like just everything you can think of. It's just, this. he, he seems to understand it all. It's very strange. Wow. Um, but despite it all, you know, he believed God was a necessary existent. He, he argued for God's existence in many of his books. Um, pretty, pretty, pretty hefty, eh? What this man has done so far, right? Fascinating human, for sure. Um, it's amazing uh, to think about some yeah. of these uh, older individuals that were able to create these huge, like, I think there's, I don't know if you're familiar, a guy named Rudolf Steiner. He has like 30 mm-hmm. feet of bookshelf space that, makes up the writings of his of all of the writings that he's um produced which it just Impressive. blows blows yeah. my mind <laughs> um but yeah no, to, it's, it's amazing yeah but i wanted to ask you before we go deeper into the uh unani uh, system i wanted to ask about the materia medica 
what are some of the like majorly revered uh, plants or herbs within the materia medica are there any like very more held in high regard than others that that come across within the materia medica yeah so since we're I, I'll, I'll talk about islamic in particular materia okay. medica because that's what we focus on simples a lot more as opposed to complex formulas which unani tends to do mm -hmm. uh yeah, there are quite a few plants that pop out. Like we have olive that was mentioned quite a few times in the Quran. Figs, um, frankincense and myrrh, absolutely, were, were mentioned significantly. Um, saffron, pomegranate peel, nutmeg. Uh, you can you can, you can see like the Materia Medica is clearly for the region. Um, and one of the most revered honeys we use is Sidr honey, which is basically from the Zazyphus Spinus Christus. So it's basically uh, a, a biblical tree. A, a lot of the main Islamic honeys we use are all from biblical trees: the Aphel tree, the the uh, acacia tree, the uh, you know the oh. it's, the, Z the Zyphus tree is basically twinned with the Jujube tree in, in TCM. It's just like the Middle Eastern version, um, said so, to have its roots. Yeah, go ahead. So these honeys that you're talking about, these are different than like bee created honeys, or well, they're bee created honeys, but they're uh, from specific. The, the, the medical efficiency of a honey is literally from its pollen source. Um, okay, and that makes sense. In, in the Middle East, some of the more heavier medicinal honeys tend to be from, uh, I, I don't think it's a coincidence, they tend to be from uh, the trees that are quite heavily mentioned in all three of the sky religions the Torah, mm. the Christian religion, and the Islamic religion. Like, yeah. Quite heavily. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, acacia mm -hmm. definitely being one of those. Yeah, yeah, as we know, yeah. Um, so yeah, the, back to this. I mean, Ibn Sina, essentially the the magnum opus, dude, is the canon of medicine, um, and that was his second book. It came out in five volumes and in one million words, and it was essentially the manuscript of medical knowledge for almost eight hundred, eight, about yeah, eight to nine centuries globally in the wow. entire world. You couldn't get into the University of Vienna for the longest time without having read it. Samuel Hahnemann, the father of homeopathy, learned Arabic to read it. It, it was a significant book. Um, and, you know, there's interesting counterpoints to it in history. Like you have somebody like Paracelsus who, who burnt the canon of medicine, you know, to symbolize the break from the past and what have you. Um, you know, I'll talk <laughs> about that probably in another day. There's, there's quite to discuss there, but, um, yeah, the canon of medicine that. essentially. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not a fan personally because I know what's in it. It's pretty good, right? Yeah. Um, but like the influence of the canon of medicine, dude, can be seen as far as like as deep actually into as into folk Afro American remedies, where you can see some of the actual compounds are using originating from the canon of medicine. Um, and I think one of the critical things the Unani system developed that was different from the Islamic system where the Islamic system, the beating heartbeat of it was mosques, basically. This is where they started founding hospitals. They had, the Unani hospitals back then would quite frankly shame what we have today. Uh, immense structures, lecture halls, mosques were embedded between, there were libraries, there were kitchens, there were dispensaries, there was charity wards, there were qualified male and female nurses. Um, and there's like apparently there's like a quote that said that day and night there were 50 reciters uh, reciting the Quran out loud, um, which is interesting counterpoint because they tended to be not as religious, but it showed that they still had some sort of re re relevance to that. Yeah. Uh, at nightfall, musicians played soft melodies to put people to sleep and induce drowsiness. Professional storytellers were available to tell the sick tales to keep their minds busy. And when patients left the hospital, they were given enough money so they would not resume work immediately. Wow. Tell me where we missed the point with the we need to today. resurrect that system, right? <laughs> right. So, um, so it's 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 easy to see how something like that is very supportive to the entire process of healing, yeah. uh, and just from mental to physical. Yeah. Just so I have it clear, is Unani? Is that like a people group or what? What is? No, you know. no, no. So Unani in Arabic means Greek, Unani. Uh, oh. And it basically symbolizes how a lot of this information came from Greek oh, translations and, okay. and what have you. Unani medicine is basically a super melting pot of um, 
what's it called? Um, um, Arabic, uh, Islamic, Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, and everything available at the time, and Greek wow. just smashed together into like a super modality. That that basically what they did. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So that's where we got the basis of filtration, distillation, sublimation, calci calcification, um, floral oils, dist distillative oils. Um, this is the this is where it all came from. This sort of dude, this kind of text, right? So. Just something to keep in mind, the Unani system is based off that. So if you're ever going to explore it, definitely. I think, I mean, I've seen English translations of the canon of medicine, and there's one or two that are just focusing on volume one. Um, it's pretty decent, but ideally, obviously, if you could read the Arabic text, you go to them. But um, yeah, that's, um, that's really the only issue, I suppose, the access to Arabic at this point as a barrier to most people, right? Yeah, for sure. And so within the Unani uh, tradition or the system, are there, within this, it seems like it's obviously a wide variety of the different things from general, like you were saying, like uh, uh, Ayurvedic or different herbalism, kind of melting pot. And then within it, there are some alchemical, more like alchemical stuff as well, or is that a separate thing or... It's it's difficult to say because alchemical is, is difficult to define. But true, I would true. argue yes. I would argue yes. But the Thib system, so the Unani system is known as the Thib system, T-I-B. Mm. Thib is the modern Arabic word for uh, um, medical study. Uh, oh, okay. And the practitioner is either known as Hakim, if it's a male, or Hakima, if she's a female, um, or what have you. And um, it basically means wise or wise, wise one. Um, and it's a, it, the system focused on bringing in the humoral theories, which I think a lot of us are very familiar with, you know, where you're looking at uh, fire, air, earth, water, or sanguine, um, melancholy, phlegm, depending on what you're thinking of, right? There's many different ways to kind of express these terms. Um, but yeah, the constitution system came in basically, and it was almost an upgrade. So we had the Chinese system come in first with yin and yang, and then we had Ayurveda come in with pitta, vata, katha. And then we have these guys come in humoral and they're just like, no, we're going to do it with four. We're going to get a lot more coordinates that way. So it's 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 interesting to see uh, consistency and build up through different cultures. I think that's a big part of my East meets West style of clinical herbalism. I try to find if I try to find consistency in multiple cultures. And that's where I know I'm on the right track, especially if I can match it to modern day science. Then I really know I'm on the right track. Right. Definitely. So that's that's a big part of it yeah yeah so um well what are some of the more important aspects from anani medicine that in your personal pra practice maybe that you've adopted or your explorations that you find have a lot of efficacy or or kind of like you said a lot of consistency and um yeah. ability to uh produce uh really uh important uh results in your opinion or or your Totally, totally. Let's talk about them. So um, a couple of things I, I have taken from Unani. I, I teach this to a lot of my students as well, um, who, who, are who are really excited to bring these uh, ideologies into their practice. So um, I work a lot with, it's similar to Western herbalism, where prescriptions tend to have different, different temperamental classes. So paying attention to uh, heat, hot and cold, wet or dry, that kind of thing. Um, but the two main things I'd say that I, I really enjoy from the Unani system that is almost like inherently part of my differential diagnostic technique right now as a practitioner uh, is the seven components of the naturals as well as the six factors of health. Uh, one, the seven components of naturals is almost like a little bit more theoretical in nature. The second, a bit more down to earth. And I'll, I'll talk about a little bit about both, both of them. So the seven components of the natural First being the elements, they, t they talk about the elements, water, fire, earth, air, you know, essentially. Um, and, you know, where they're at within that particular client, so to speak. And then in the second component of that subgroup, they talk about the temperaments uh, and of which there are nine kinds, eight are non equable and one equable or balanced. So you have, you know, the hot, cold, wet, dry, hot, dry, hot, wet, that kind of thing. Um, and one thing that's really unique with Unani especially when you compare it to something like Ayurveda. Here's where there's a little bit of a break. Um, and I think they kind of evolved it to the region, is temperaments 
change with age. Now, this is very interesting because in Ayurveda, the initial constitution you're born with is frozen through life mostly. It is only, which is called uh, Prakruti. I think that was it. Yeah. And then um, the, um, yeah, yeah, I think, I think that's it. I don't speak Sanskrit, but that's, I think that's what the word is. And then the uh, Vikruti, yes, that's it, is in Ayurveda is where your doshic balance is today relative to your birth thing. In the Unani system, it's a little bit different. Your temperaments change with age. It's pretty cool. So when you're, and that makes a lot more sense to me. When you're youthful, you're a lot more prone to hot and humid. Okay. As you get into adult age, you're a lot more prone to hot and dry conditions. Maturity, you're starting to get into cold and dry dominance. And as you get older, principal organs get cold and dry. There's a moisture that starts collecting the internal of your body that's cold and moist. And as it dries up, with, with complete drying up of moisture, that is death. Mm. And that is a very interesting concept that we see correlate to a lot of biological sciences today. How are we working on youth? How are we work, working on promoting anti-aging techniques? Uh, hyaluronic acid, from just holding moisture pretty much. Uh, what, collagen, we're looking at a glucosamate supplement. These are all focusing on moisture. You know see what I'm trying to say? Like lubrication, keeping things. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, yeah. So yeah, I wonder if you if you could explain for people the con concept of doshic balance and the doshas in general for people that may not be familiar. Totally. Yeah, yeah. So with Ayurveda, there's um, different subgroups of um, people, if you will. There is the Vata, which means wind, basically. There's Pitta, which means fire, and then there's Kapha, which means earth. Now, um, what I'm about to say here is a little bit different to how most people learn it in the West. Um, most Western Ayurveda is, is learned by uh, Basant Lad, who is very popular in America, but he is not very popular in the East because he essentially has devised his own style of Ayurveda. And although it works for him, it, it is not necessarily very transferable. So um, what I'm trying to get at is in the West, most people are taught that folks are predominantly one dosha, and that makes it a lot easier. But the reality is most people, uh, all of us have all three doshas, all three kind of uh, 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 components, if you will. Uh, it's, it's just in different uh, ratios. So most people actually have a dual dominance. Like for example, I'm just gonna take this as an example. You could be like vata pitta dominant, and that would mean that your, va your air and fire are maybe like 40%, 40%, and the rest would be earth. So that would make you a vata pitta, something like that. Someone like me is straight pitta. So I'm probably like 80% fire, 15 wind, five earth, just as an example. So this is something that's very important to recognize, especially if you're getting into Ayurvedic studies in the West. Most people are dual dominant doshas, not singles. And that's basically it. So it's the Ayurvedic system of categorizing people based on body type, and digestive power, and personality. Right. Yeah. I wonder, do you, I don't know if you go into this area or not, but I wonder if you've found any correlations between individuals, particular doshas, and then their astrological, um, like chart, for example, have you, are you in, in that area at all or? Yeah, I, I, I don't dive too much into astrological, especially with doshas because they're tied more into Jyotish, which is like Ayurvedic, Vedic astrology, which is totally. It's its own thing. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's, uh, I've, I've wet my feet in it, but I just don't have the time in it right now because of the amount of focus I have in For sure. how it works. Got a lot of <laughs> other stuff going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, that's fascinating. Are there any other interesting points that you want to touch on with the... Uh, yeah, yeah. So with um, the seven components of the natural, so we talked about the elements, the temperaments, which they talk about, and the temperaments are really interesting in, uh, in Unani. Again, I want to stress that it, because they really seem to have taken into account adaptations and what have you. As an example, uh, you have somebody that moves perhaps from the Middle East to um, North America, like myself from Kuwait to Canada, 50 centigrade to minus 50, like complete shift. Uh, the the inner body, the chi, the prana, the life force, the vital force, whatever you want to call it, depending on the modality, requires a sort of adjustment period to actually really get acquainted with that environment. And in some cases, it may require generations, right? Mm. Uh, and so 
very important to recognize that and compensate and, and assist the vital force in, 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 in correcting itself. And that's probably a big, big reason why I got so sick within two years of moving here. Because I'd, I'd have traveled around the world and eaten and, you know, it wasn't any normal to me, but I had settled here. And I think that is what really just flipped to me. So interesting to see that, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, the elements, the temperaments, um, seven components and the naturals. Um, the humors is also what they talk about. So blood, yellow bile, phlegm, black bile, and the relations. Uh, the fourth thing they talk about are the four principal organs, actually. So they focus on them quite a bit. The brain, the heart, the liver, and the reproductive system. Uh, and they see all the other organs as servants to these primary organs. So pr these, these four organs are chiefly like, focused on and then branched outward, so to speak. So really cool. They obviously understood quite a bit about the human body to focus on them. Um, and then the last three that they focus on it, forces, um, external or natural forces, whether it be weather or what have you, perhaps. Uh, actions, which is the sixth point, which is amount of exercise, stress, work, stuff like that. You can think of it that way. And then lastly, the spirits. Uh, and that is perhaps spirituality, one's expression, one's connection to God and that kind of thing. So these seven components of the natural, as you can see, they're kind of theoretical in nature. It's very difficult for a practitioner to take that and be like, what am I doing? Uh, but the six factors of health coming up, right, um, is, is really where I teach a lot of my students application, modern day application. Like the first seven are almost like philosophical in nature. And I would apply those principles, especially when I coagulated the, some, some of those garlic gems, that's where that knowledge would come into play. The six factors of health though, are really, really cool. They're very scientific in nature. Um, we're talking about the quantity and quality and the time and sequence of said factors that can really affect treatment. So first and foremost, we talk about the air, the quality of one's air, the season, the temperature, right? And just to give you an example, we uh, an Unani practitioner would know that cold has a constricting effect. Therefore, we know it strengthens digestion. Therefore, we know it increases urine output. Uh, we know that foggy weather uh, creates depression and disturbs the humors a lot more. We know that in autumn, we, that produces the most humoral imbalance because that's the biggest difference temperature between night and day. Uh, we know that in autumn also, because of the greatest, uh, um, the, that's kind of like when we harvest, we eat too much fruit and there's a lot more unresolved excess humor from the summer. So th these kind of things are essentially ideas and ways you can apply uh, some of this information in the clinical context. They also mention as a second point, the sixth factor of health, the, the food, food and beverage, great emphasis on this. Um, and, 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 you know, most illnesses are seen to arise from long continued errors of diet and regimen as stated by Avicenna. Um, they talk about the three aspects of metabolism quite a bit. They talk about digestion, assimilation, and residue with great detail. Um, viewing the, the processes of, uh, of uh, uh, the process as foods are cooked by the body, you know, broken down and refined into different areas. Uh, they talk about eating with a response with regards to metabolic um, principles, different energetics, you know what I mean, which is compatible with the Ayurvedic system of eating with regards to doshic power and what have you. Right. This is a consistency you see here in two cultures. Now, did you did you say that cold strengthens digestion? Uh, to me, that sounds a little counterintuitive because in my mind, I would think cold as being more solidified or a fixing force and then heat being like a more breaking down, liberating principle. But maybe you can talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, no, let's talk about it. So it's very interesting you say that. And that's essentially true. But then when you think about it from a biological perspective, when you get cold, you actually are going to build up more heat and generate more heat, essentially. Okay. You think of it, uh, think of it and a fat, like think, go back to caveman and women days, winter, yeah. woolly mammoth hits. That's when we are harvesting large amounts of meat and eating large amounts of brain. So uh, funny enough, our digestion is actually a lot more powerful in the winter because that's when we're eating the fattiest animals and the stuff we hunt. Yeah. So it, it's very interesting to see it's actually the opposite. Our internal fire gets a lot more powerful because it's cold outside. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's, those are important points to for people because that's something i just wouldn't have yeah. thought about so that's cool 
Yeah, like it, it, another example that, that would skip people's head is perhaps is like, oh, okay, when I drink alcohol, I feel warmer. Actually, you're feeling colder. What happens mm-hmm. is your your cold, your your heat is going from your core out to your peripherals. Yeah, you're gonna feel warmer for a short period of time, but watch yourself draw pretty quickly as soon as that takes a as soon as the booze wears off, basically, right? So another example of how we've kind of misunderstood innate heat, if you will. Yeah, for sure. And in your practice, do you entertain or work at all with the like chakra systems or anything like that? Or is that a little different? Um, I, I can just because I've done some Ayurvedic training, but um, I personally don't. Uh, I, I just find it very difficult to apply this to most my client base. If I did have a particular client that's perhaps a bit more apt into Ayurvedic or yogic systems and, and requests it, sure. We can get into that. I can get into prescribing various pranayama routines and breathing exercises and what have you, and even go as far as prescribing various mudras, like hand gestures to do during, um, you know, meditation and what have you. Yeah. Um, it, there's so many ways to go about it. Very subtle things you can add in, in terms of layers. Like as an example, this Western concept of doing this, when you mostly see folks doing this when they're doing uh, yogic shots or what have you. And what this does is actually increase the wind um, uh, element, the vata. And there's a chronic vata, high vata thing going on in the West. And so most people doing this actually just kind of make it worse. So uh, it, yeah. it's pretty interesting to see that, right? <laughs> that is funny. Um, and so what is your take personally on uh, like meat consumption? Do you yourself consume meat? Uh, no judgment either way. I'm just curious. No, no, I, I'm a totally an omnivore. I'm born and raised in the desert. Um, you know, my great great uncle died in 1998 at 121 years old as the wow. world's oldest banker. So wow. I follow what he ate because he did it right. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I really do believe that eating according to your ancestral bloodline works. Um, I think vegetarianism has merits and i think being able to go completely plant-based is very difficult and very genetic uh based um not everybody can do that very efficiently and in my practice i have only seen one human being ever who is completely plant-based through life a a jamaican gentleman Hmm. Uh, and it was genetically you could see it like he was just a powerful man his blood results were incredible i couldn't understand it but he um, he was able to he had processes in the body or and was able to absorb non heme iron, which is like the vegetable iron, a lot more efficiently wow. than somebody from the desert, right? So it makes sense. You know? Yeah, yeah. I've I have attempted. Uh, I've tried it. You know, just out of curiosity. But for me, it wasn't it wasn't my path or it wasn't successful. And so I am somebody that does try to consume at least ethical, you know, produced or treated animals and. I think they're everybody has their different lines, you know, with what what it constitutes a ethic ethical uh, meat consumption. Some people don't even care at all, but yeah. um, I just always yeah. love to ask people because I think it's an interesting topic for sure. For sure, for sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, yeah. definitely, and um, yeah. So, like on the just kind of wrap up the food thing, basically a similar thing to Ayurveda that you see in Unani medicine is. They talk about digestion as incomplete digestion, rather, as the buildup of toxins or what's seen in Ayurveda as AMA, AMA. Uh, and the club system or Unani is, has a different take on it. They see it as a buildup of superfluous matter in which your eventually your body hits the limit and chooses to correct it, either through you know diarrhea or vomiting or what have you, uh, or mucus, perhaps, or perspiration. And it's very interesting to see how Western allopathic medicine is very quick to correct and stop said processes. We're very quick to stop vomiting or diarrhea or fevers or any process that's sent to essentially disrupt biotic uh, dominance. Um, so, yeah, just something to take note of, right? Yeah. And the six factor of health, yeah. So um, with, because uh, I've assumed, I'm assuming you've, you've probably seen a lot of different patients at this point. And so you probably have gained yeah. a little bit of experience and maybe you've noticed maybe some patterns with what are what are some of the more common ailments or uh obviously it's different everybody's individual but i wonder if there are some commonalities just in terms of like maybe our western diets these days or western problems that are occurring uh from your perspective for sure yeah I'd, i'd love to talk about that um yeah i i've worked with a lot of different things under the sun um 
I tend to see a lot of autoimmune conditions, thyroid disorders, particularly with plant-based people, actually. Um, and I've seen cancers, post-COVID, you've got all these interesting mystery, mystery hyper-inflammatory disorders, uh, digestive chronic disorders, I, hormones, infertility. To be honest, I kind of work with everything. Um, I just, I really, I'm, I'm fascinated with all areas of disease and illness in the human body that I can't necessarily specialize. Uh, I am, I suppose, a bit more experienced with what is presented to me. So yeah, a lot of thyroid and autoimmune. And I tend to get the cases that naturopaths are stuck on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just they're like, go to him. So that's, that's kind of it, basically. That's funny. Do you, are we able to maybe touch on any of your gemstone work or did you want to wait on that? I, w I was curious. I thought it'd be fun to maybe. Yeah, talk yeah, yeah. Um, definitely. Uh, we can touch up on that. So um, the, so the gemstone work is um, somewhat of philosophical in nature, but I've managed to create a tangibly measurable physical a substance that I've also ingested um it's essentially a quintessence of botanical origin but it's clearly a mineral uh in in what it is um and you know i, I can't even dissolve it in water it's actually like a stone it's actually a mineral gem it's a very that's what bizarre. i was gonna ask i was um, wondering about that yeah 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 which is very interesting because one of my main mentors that i've you know kind of taken this path to be inspired by osborne who is of the ripley and norton kind of school of thought mm -hmm. um I, I know for a fact that there's their stones their, their gemstones were water soluble and so uh, there's something clearly particular about garlic which is why the iraqi alchemists that i know really work with only almost anytime i see them doing botanical work they just do garlic stuff mm -hmm. um and looking at it as an herbalist and from a mystic perspective and from an occult perspective garlic holds a lot of weight there's a lot going on for it chemically uh mythically uh, so i'm not surprised to see something as pungent and as powerful as that bulb to yield in impressive results this way right um and so essentially what i did was i was trying to mimic a particular middle eastern garlic work pyrolytic style work where um you see with a lot of the western style quintessence works that folks are familiar with them there tends to be an omission of the alchemist sulfur or the fire principle, which is toxic and what have you. And that makes sense. But, but interestingly enough, in the Arabic or Iraqi preparation in particular, the only end products that are used in, in this particular quintessence that I'm now trying to formulate is the fire and earth, which is absolutely bizarre from a European and Western perspective. Um, and but you can't just use the fire and earth that way. There's a particular method, which I'm currently investigating and working with, using putrefication to temper the fire. And that's, I, I'm just going to kind of leave it at that for now for folks to think about, yeah. because I have not seen anybody do this at all that speaks English. I've seen very, two dudes in the Middle East. Yeah. It's very interesting. And I'm curious, like, what kind of density does it have? It And does it get firmer over time or like? Could you grow it more if you fed it somehow, or are these still? I'm pretty sure I could multiply it, but I'm not really experimenting with that right now. I'm, okay. I, the multiplication stuff I'm doing is more uh, kind of like the Ripley mineral life gardening, using botanical origin stuff to grow essentially intelligent mineral stones and what have you. So that that's a completely different realm and work to this. That's more where I kind of experiment with growing and replication. For these, I just sublingually was consuming it consume them twice so far and as somebody who has never ever felt any energetic medicine in my entire life ever nothing homeopathic nothing essences nothing none of that elixir stuff nothing um holy moly I, it was like three days of of i i don't know how to describe this to you like it, it, it's like almost like your brain circuitry is it's like a, a, a primordial switch went off and wow. It's very interesting. I, I don't feel the same since. It's it's a good thing, though. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, wow, that's so fascinating. I, I can't wait to um just see what becomes of it and your work to continue with things like this. And could yeah, we? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Are, are we able to touch on any of the mineral gardening aspects of things, or did you want to wait? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we can. I, I just want to point out real quickly the, uh, um, 
what's really interesting to me is uh, I, I want to point out the difference between herbalism, spagyrics, and alchemy. They're Please. all they're different. They're mm -hmm. and as spagyrics and alchemy tend to be intertwined and spill into over into each other. Yes, but alchemical medicine has always been noted to be very safe and very profound in effect. Mm -hmm. And that's something I have never, ever, ever felt before in anything I've ever taken or done in my years of herbalism and spagyrics. This crystal stuff was truly kickstarted the whole belief system in me, in me that, wow, there is something to energetic medicine and that I need to work more on these profound, subtle, um, almost like neural circuit effects that I have ignored for so long being an herbalist first, because I tended to focus on the physical effects of things, right? Yeah. And one of the interesting things too, that I was just thinking about was I've heard some instances of if people are ingesting too much garlic, they can get a sense of brain fog, which is kind of interesting compared to like what you're working with. It's almost the opposite. It's almost like you're opening up and uh, facilitating more of a activity within your brain in terms of at least your personal experience with it. So that's, I don't know, just fascinating to me. Yeah. Uh, bring that up. It um, is. It is. This particular gemstone work, in my opinion, is void of any signature of any plant. Like, yes, I have obtained it through the gateway of garlic, but it is signatureless. It is literally the four elements. You can think of it essentially as coagulated azoth or universal spirit or, or fixed salamoniac combined with its uh, elements so it won't fly. This is, this is the above so below concept that we look at in alchemy. And that is probably why the effects were absolutely profound. Like it, it was, like I said, it's like, I, I was like, I'm not, nothing, a, a sense of euphoria and, 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 and thought processes that I probably have never engaged in. So it's pretty interesting to see how this will evolve. Yeah. And okay. So mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about mineral gardening. That might be a foreign concept yeah. for a lot of people. So when you're saying mm -hmm. mineral gardening, I would assume this is along the lines of being able to uh grow various different types of minerals in some way by i don't really know i mean maybe you can get into it like what's the process look like and are you providing a specific it, it, condition with yeah. like yeah go, let's just go on take it certainly, away certainly certainly yeah, lion work and from the line of osborne and ripley and what have you um essentially focuses on showing that the mineral realm in my eyes, this is how I see it, that the mineral realm can be covertly applied to, at least the mineral, mineral works or what have you, can be applied to the vegetable realm, which in, in some cases are predominantly minerals. Look at something like uh, horsetail, equisitum, arbens, 70% silica. Where are we going with this? Like, are we in the mineral or plant realm? Where are we there, right? So this stuff is very interesting because it's the concept of transferring intelligence the green lion evolving into the red lion uh, the more uh, and you see this in al a lot of imagery and algorithms and and and, and what have you uh, in especially with like um, alchemical texts and and paintings and what have you where you see the lion eating the sun and what have you this is kind of the concept we're going with right uh, so basically in a nutshell it's transferring the growth principle and intelligence of a plant into inanimate earth and allowing it to grow and then you know nourishing it's almost like a, 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 an alchemical tamagotchi pet if you will <laughs> where you basically feed it like one of those e-pets uh so you're you to me it is truly a lot more viable and 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 medicinal and accept and accessible than these um freighter alberta style essential oil stones which to me are parlor tricks uh and, and not alchemy at all um, and so, yeah, it's essentially growing mineral life off of dead earth matter, if you will. Yeah. So, okay. I, so what you're saying is you've got like this vegetative life principle that you're getting from the plant realm, and then you're kind of transferring that vegetative growth factor somehow in order to facilitate the growth within these minerals. I'm curious, what are some of the minerals specifically that you've worked with and what are some of the processes? What does it look like in terms of practical application and all that? 
Yeah, um, I, I, I don't work with the mineral realm or the metal realm in particular, and I really have no interest in, in going there because for me, alchemy, I approach alchemy as an herbalist and as a practitioner. I want this for health, to optimize human beings, to optimize myself and to apply it. Uh, and because of, I guess, the bias and the inherent training and knowledge and, and uh, I have in the vegetable realm, I don't see a reason to diverge any further because I can get these answers here safer. I know how. Um, and I've seen, it's very interesting. I see this example in my work or just in my day-to-day -day living, so to speak, quite often where I, you know, I'm friends with quite a few very gifted, very, very, very gifted and knowledgeable alchemists way beyond my years of experience, 20, 30 years plus, who are deeply into the metallic and mineral realms. Um, and the two things I see consistency consistently is firstly, uh, an inability to apply such beautiful high end medicines to anything consistently or any acute or chronic ailment and almost an, un, like, it's almost like they don't really know what to do with them. And then secondly, most of these folks have defaulted back to the vegetable kingdom from what I see. And, and, and I, and the few folks that I know personally close to me have mentioned to me that they felt like they wasted years in mineral and metal kingdoms and only to fall back into the so-called lesser works to truly find the greater work within it. You see, the thing is the vegetable kingdom has the ability to evolve a lot better or quicker than these metal and mineral realms, which may have had their virtue once upon a time, but even Ripley himself stated in his era, uh, that the virtues of these metals have long been lost long ago and that's then he said that so uh, looking at 2023 looking at the world how it's evolving what we're doing to the planet the vegetable realm has that ability to somewhat keep up with us right now we i i, I think the metal and mineral realm needs some time to almost like patch up at this point and you can see very easy examples of this of the, the plant realm at work where at least for me as a trained herbalist, like I, I can walk around in the city sometimes and almost know what a house inhabitants ailments are based on the weeds that pop up there. It, it's very interesting to see motherwort patches in people that have high blood pressure or palpitations or stuff like that, you know what I mean? Or poke weed pop up in the, in, in the backyard of a woman that's just developing breast cancer. Like what? So um, that's a really good and, and like a measurable example of, of plant realm keeping up with us right yeah okay so then all valid points with the mineral gardening work are you are you are you working i mean did you say you're not working with minerals or i guess yeah i'm not i'm working with plants basically i'm i'm working with the minerals within the plants so okay. i i see it i mean this is just my viewpoint i see it as a kingdom within a kingdom mm -hmm. almost like a kingdom at this point I think if you push the extremes of the vegetable kingdoms, you will recognize that, um, I mean, the mineral works are there, um, especially when you look at something like the tartar alkahest, you know, where you're taking like wine diamonds and what have you and, and doing the dry distillation and sublimating that. that. That is like a very in-between kind of realm too. So that's probably as far as, as I'm personally interested in pushing mineral and metallic realms. Because for me, I li I'd like to continue to explore growing living minerals from botanical life that is that is what i see to be the mineral work that needs to be focused on awesome okay so growing the minerals from botanical life what are some of the 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 minerals that you've been able to work with and grow from botanical life and that you're focusing on currently yeah so like i mean I, I wouldn't I I wouldn't chemically know the analysis of them per se 100%, but we're working with the, you know the potassium carbonate earth essentially and growing off what is called the sulfur of nature as per Ripley and and um, uh, Osborne's teachings, um, and you know working into sublimating that or creating philosophical acetone perhaps or working into growing in other. Um, higher and what they call the poor man's stone. That's kind of what I've been focused on right now. And it's basically creating living, growing mineral stones through botanical origin. So that to me is a very fascinating focus because accessibility and empowerment to me, getting going towards the path of the stone, the greater works or what have you, in my eyes, I would much rather take the humbler 
the poor man's path, so to speak, because I think there's a lot more virtue in that. I think it's a lot more badass to complete the great work if if one ever does with less. Sure. Yeah. And did you say earlier wine wine diamonds? Did I hear that? Yeah, wine diamonds is another term for uh, tartaric acid or these, you know, the, crystal, the the purple crystals found in wine barrels that they make cream of tartar with. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I don't I haven't heard that, but it sounds awesome. <laughs> um, what are some? Yeah, of yeah, the, it's a it's, it's these. Yeah. Yeah, is that like a uh something that has been used medicinally, or is it for a different application? It's a different application. It's what you use to create what's called the tartar alkahest. And there's many different things you can do with that, apparently from mainly to open mineral realms and what have you, perhaps, or, and, and there's various recipes within the veg vegetable realm that one can get into. I'm getting into different experiments with it eventually, but um, I'm preoccupied a lot more right now with understanding and doing very interesting and extreme experiments with the actual sulfur and mercury from the vegetable kingdom, which has been erroneously uh, taught, unfortunately, by a lot of alchemists to a generation of alchemists um, as, you know, the essential oil or the ethanol, basically. Uh, and nothing can be further from the truth, unfortunately. If anyone out there is interested in purchasing any elixirs, spagyrics, alchemical formulations of any kind, do go and check out medicinebuddhalabs.com. And stay tuned because Taylor's actually in the midst of producing a liquid supplement containing a spagyric tincture of ashwagandha and shilajit. The shilajit's lab-tested Siberian shilajit. It's going to be roughly 25 grams per bottle, and it'll be sold at basically 15 to 20 percent under what the market is currently charging for shilajit. So definitely stay tuned for that and. As always, enter PM Podcast at checkout for 10% off. Also, potable gold, Aram Potable. If you're looking for a solid source, Benjamin Terrell, the Temple of Mercury is the man. He's my personal go-to and I can attest to the quality. TheTempleofMercury.com. Philocast at checkout for 15% off. Additionally, if you want an extensive variety of alchemical offerings, check out ukeotiques.com, E-A-U-X-C-H-A-O-T-I-Q-U-E-S.com. Go on there, check out the shop. There's tinctures, elixirs, essences, mushroom blends and extracts, crystal and mineral metallics, ends tinctures, resins, all kinds of goodness. So uh, do go check that out. If there's something you like, uh, Philopod at checkout for 15% off of your order. Interesting. What do you find that are some of the major misconceptions in terms of things like the understanding of the, the mercury or the sulfur principle in that regard? I mean, what I'm seeing is for lack of a better word, and to sound harsh, almost like the doTERRA of alchemy evolving before my eyes. It's disturbing, uh, and it's it's alluring, and it's simple, and that's why it's working and it's pulling people in. Because you can have that allure, you can have the glass where you're boiling, you're vaporizing, you, you feel like that witch, but it's unfortunately really clever marketing at play too, and, and I it's disappointing to me because I a lot of the purveyors of said knowledge yeah, probably are aware of what's going on so it's it's I, i'm really hoping that you know a lot more for, folks start to question the status quo of what is so-called current alchemy and really get back to it and it's a to me one of the biggest red flags and then that was even as when i first discovered all this was when somebody told me that essential oil was one of the tree of prima concepts and, and the focus on isolating essential oil uh, I, I knew something was very wrong right away. I knew something was very wrong from an energetic and from a therapeutic perspective. Something was off. Okay. Right? So I would think like in my mind, and I might be off with this, if I was to describe or correspond the essential oil to a principle, I would say it corresponds with the sulfur principle because it's containing um, 
you know, the, the tincture aspects or the, the compounds that would be like the soul or the essence of the plant. But in your view, is that not the case? Do you, do you see that as differently? Is it working? I'm trying to, yeah, I just joined in from my, uh, Awesome. Let me just sign off. I'm not sure why I'm bouncing off a lot today. I was trying to get in on my phone, but it won't let me unmute. No worries. Okay. So All right. Where were we at? I was saying, so I would think that yeah. with, uh, if I was looking at a plant or something to break it down, the, the common understanding in my perspective is that the alcohol that you get from, from breaking the plant down would be corresponding to the mercurial principle and the the essential oil like you had mentioned would be like uh more of a sulfuric principle of like relating to the soul or the essence of the plant but are you saying right. that and you're understanding it's a little different and if so i'm curious maybe how you would go about yeah it, it's it, it's not even different it's, it's completely wrong actually the only thing that they got right in that tria prima system or the modern day interpretation of it is the salt the the mercury and the sulfur I'm not sure why or how, but it was greatly misinterpreted. Um, and is, as is evident by the lack of efficiency from said elixirs and essences that are promoted and created under the Junius, um, you know, Bartlett style kind of um, system per, per se, because there is a no therapeutic, very little rather therapeutic value in my opinion, uh, to these uh, essences and elixirs, especially when compared to a spagyric tincture. And if we're starting to use these medicines for energetic values uh, or, or what have you, quite frankly, I think homeopathy, classic homeopathy is superior. Uh, so I, I don't really, I, I, I just, it just didn't work for me, but I've essentially proven that uh, energetic medicine is real by consuming the quintessence thing that we just talked about. And having an effect I've never felt on any energetic medicine. So um, there is definitely something to be said about that. And um, and I, I really do encourage most spagyrists or practicing alchemists or anybody that is training in, in the alchemical style of thinking, so to speak, to really investigate and go deeper. The Arabs themselves, too, didn't talk about it. Because I... I um, Part of what I'm doing is translating over the Corpus Arabic Alchemicum, uh, which very only like a little bit of it is spilled over into English. And they're not talking about the sulfur and and um, mercury principles as this either. There, it's literally the the the, the print alchemy really is predominantly a lot of it is pyrolytic stuff. So it's 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 quite fascinating to see how we've almost again, gotten a doTERRA slash young living essential oils approach to alchemy to make it more digestible, but that's not really it. Yeah, it's interesting. And I know I did, I have interviewed a a guy that's pretty invested in to the pyrolytic tradition is uh, Rubophilo Soufler. I think he's in New Zealand. Yeah. And he talks a lot yeah, about yeah. the Norton line of things and the, uh, yeah. Uh, what, what was the other name? I'm blanking on it. But yeah, that whole Ripley, Ripley and all that. Yeah. And it seemed like from his, uh, maybe I misunderstood his interpretation, but it seemed like the three principles were still contained within his view. But uh, yeah, I guess everybody does see things a little bit differently. So it's it's always fascinating and interesting for me. I think it can be useful from an outsider's perspective at least to start with a foundation to get familiar with some of the uh, concepts, perhaps, uh, at least for me, it, it, I kind of see when, when, when I've heard people describe spagyria and it's okay if you disagree with this, but I'll just give you my, my, okay. my opinion. When I've heard people mm -hmm. describe it in the sense of how you can break down different plants into these three principles it makes a lot of sense for me, but I, I definitely am open to any other perspectives. It just seems like, yeah, like the soul, the sulfur, uh, the, the essential oils or the aroma, the aromatic compounds, the tincturing compounds, um, it provides a, a, a nice structure to work with. 
I guess. And then the the yeah. recombination of those principles, kind of like when you're breaking them down, you're you're purifying and you're separating out um, any impurities, and then you're kind of bringing them all back together. And I don't know, it always kind of made sense with me, but I totally, I I love yeah. to hear. Yeah. I, I, it did for a while for me too, but um, like the essential oil component of a plant is less than 1%, less than half a percent in most cases. Uh, so there's really very little representation of a plant there. Mm -hmm. And to call it its soul is incorrect because there's much more. This is pharmaceutical thinking now. We're, mm -hmm. we're kind of crossing there a little bit. Um, smelling stronger and more and more is not more. It's, it's about relative balance of all the phyto constituents. That's why spagyric tinctures will always be inherently superior to any of these because you're getting a lot more of a of the chemical cocktail of a plant rather. Yeah. Um, these inherent packages constituents provided to us by nature are very important to consider. And that's why the concept, especially like in Ayurveda where the concept of consuming a whole herb whole is superior to any extract, tincture, tea or what have you. Mm. Um, because you're getting the, the package itself. Now, remember, we can look at lots of the different examples in the plant kingdom and look at coffee. It's got 15 to 17 different carcinogens when isolated, but as a whole, coffee bean is cancer protective. See what I mean? It's it's how you break things apart that kind of matter in that regard. Yeah, that's interesting. So do you have any other particular structure that you work off of that includes different sort of aspects of like, I mean, obviously the three, it's, you know, salt, sulfur, mercury, and that could be divided. Like you could say the sulfur principle and the common understanding could be broken down into the fixed and volatile aspects of the sulfur. And I maybe, I don't know if what your structure looks like, but maybe you could talk a little bit about how you see it and, or maybe you don't even look at it like that. Maybe yeah. it's totally different. So I'm just curious. <laughs> Yeah, I, I do look at it differently now, like, because, I mean, the only thing I really do from the system you're familiar with is spagyric tinctures commercially, per se, in my practice and what have you. Um, but the elixir essence kind of style, I, I don't even bother with, to be honest. I just I just see it as a waste of my time. But I would like to say that I think it's very important. I still tell people to start with Junius's book, like, whenever they tell me what to do first. I Is think it's important Man to learn Fred, everything. Manfred Junius? And for Junius, yeah, you know, the Spagyrics book uh, or even Bartlett books or what have you. I, I think it's important to learn this, even though I don't believe in it anymore, mm -hmm. to see where it went wrong, to really understand and and and, and be able to apply the, the actual proper information. Um, yeah, it, it, you know, what we're seeing is really interesting because the great work, in my opinion, protects itself. It's got like almost like layers to an onion to it. You've got the first layer being herbalism, where a lot of people stop. Then you have that next layer of spagyrics, where it satisfies most people because they got the glass and they're burning. Then you get deeper into alchemy and then you get deeper into, you know, it's, it's very interesting I love how it. the great work has these layers. Yeah. And so that's why the age of secrecy in my eyes is dead and, and unnecessary because I can give you direct instructions on how to create these gemstones, but good luck. Like it, 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 it's not, it's not that easy to apply. It's it, I could show it to you directly and, and it's you probably still won't do like it. It's there's a certain inherent finesse and energetic. Uh, and I, what I'm seeing at least a, a spiritual embodiment to it. Um, I've done a bunch of experimenting, especially with salts in where I would use various, uh, Quranic phrases, audio manipulation, and what have you to change the inherent structure and vibrancy of the salt, basing it off, you know, water memory stuff from Masahiro Morimoto's work from like the 90s and what have you. So it's very interesting to see that applied across into herbal medicine as well, right? Definitely. Yeah, I think that's an awesome innovative technique. And I wonder that that could have been something that had occurred in the past that we've just forgotten the whole cymatic kind of imprint thing and restructuring and so i think that's awesome that you're experimenting with that um there was a name that you mentioned a couple times osborne that's i don't know who that is who who is osborne or what's the whole name with um you know known as lw osborne he's got two or three books out now for me he's um in my opinion one of the more experienced vegetable realm individuals around uh awesome. probably responsible for most alchemists translation and, and modern day understanding of the Ripley kind of thing. So uh, very, 
a very respected um, alchemist in my eyes, and um, one of the one of the bigger inspirations for me to push into the yeah. mineral and vegetable extremes that guy have. Yeah, I'll have to check that that guy out and some of his work. Um, somehow it's missed mm -hmm. missed on me. And then yeah, are there yeah, any... no, he's... sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, are there any other like very fascinating historical individuals that you feel would be cool to draw attention to um, within alchemy or maybe even some of the works that you're able to look at that you feel in the yeah, future man, are going to be very important? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we've talked about Ibn Sina or Avicenna. You know, folks, definitely check out some of his works. Um, we have Al-Razi, A-L-R-A-Z-I who is also well known for his metallic alchemy works and what have you. Um, he, he, um, he was a genius, dude, he, for his time. Like, he was appointed like one of the first uh, you know, hospital directors in Baghdad at the time. And he, he did this really cool technique, which was ahead of its time. He would go to, he was appointed to build a hospital. Check this out. He was, uh, and then, so what he did was he took meat, raw meat, and he hung it around in various parts of the city. And the area that putrefied it the, the slowest, that's where he built the hospital. Like he ah. that's just really interesting to see that kind of level of thinking back then. Um, and he was, you know, he was the dude that was like, no, diseases are specific cause. They're not a punishment from God. He He's essentially the father of pediatrics. Modern day pediatrics came from this gentleman's work, Al-Razi. Um, his, his probably his biggest book is called Al Kitab Al Hawi, which is the comprehensive medical knowledge book of that time, essentially. So Al Razi is one. Uh, we have Ibn Al Haytham, who is essentially the father of modern optics. You, uh, his book Kitab Al Manadar, which is the book of optics, shows the first experiments into light, colors, eclipses, rainbows. He ex uh, the first you know, illustrations of the anatomy of the eye and scientific uses. So that his stuff is pretty cool. And a lot of major math and physics contribution for those that are into that kind of thing. Um, I really like Ibn Nafis. Ibn Nafis is the modern, uh, the father of cardiology, basically. He understood the heart and how it worked, pulmonary vessels and veins. Uh, and all that information was confirmed 400 years later by Marcello Malfighi, I think his name was called, some Italian man. Um, but yeah, just brilliant gentlemen. Um, we have, who do we have? Uh, Al Kindi. Al Kindi is very, very fascinating as well, especially with his. If, if for those of us that are into more philosopher sort of uh, lines of works, philosophical thinking, uh, especially because he translated, he was the dude that translated or oversaw the translation of the Greek philosophical texts, Al Kindi. Um, he was the first to actually systematically determine doses for known drugs at the time too. So like he wow. quite, quite interesting work and experimented with music therapy. Yeah. So El Kindi would be another one to look at. Um, and then who else? The last one I'd say would be El Zahrawi. If, you know, for those of us that are into like medical surgery and stuff, I kind of am. Uh, I like to look at his works where he was taught very interesting techniques and in cauterization and removal of stones and surgeries and what have you. It's just, for me, it's fascinating to see how far advanced surgery was way back then, right? Wow. Yeah. Man, this was a fascinating conversation. Um, yeah. I always like to ask this, uh, just curious, always people's different beliefs and whatnot in terms of like maybe any particular spiritual or religious practices that you personally gravitate towards do you have any kind of opinion or or concept of god or anything like that or maybe anything around yeah that? i mean I, I i'm a i'm a muslim so um i'm probably more sufi oriented although i'm born and raised in the sunni tradition um they're all fairly similar to be honest i i don't I don't like to start differentiating between the innards of Islam. So yeah, I, I would consider myself a Muslim for sure. Um, and, you know, it's it's fascinating to me that the great work um, has, has caused me to go much more deeper into my own culture, heritage, and language than I've ever been before, because I realize the missing gap now. Yeah. Um, and I think it's very important, or as, as much as I can, like, de to dedicate as much time as I can to pulling this data out and sharing it with the community. Um, because there's a lot of really cool stuff in there that we've missed. Yeah. That's all I could say. Like, it, it's really, really interesting. Well, I'm greatly appreciative that you're doing it because I don't really know 
many who are so <laughs> pretty awesome yeah, yeah um, exactly it's, it's rough <laughs> are there is there any last messages or any information at all that you'd just like to put out there for anybody listening um yeah just honestly i the takeaway i'd like to just kind of give implement or plant the seed is in the west in particular it would seem that the ayurvedic and chinese system have captivated the so-called audience um and um you know more and more recently more amazonian stuff and what have you um and there's this part of the world that is essentially completely overlooked and ignored whether it be to, to religious stigma social stigma or what have you and you know I hope folks like myself who are fairly Western looking, you know, fair, uh, decently English speaking individuals breaking down those walls and barriers can, can really showcase an area um, of the world that can bring a lot of service to the Western health hemisphere, so to speak. And, and by, by popularizing things like Arabic, Islamic medicine and what have you, Unani medicine, I think we will take off a really crushing unnecessary burden on TCM and Ayurveda right now to meet the demand for the entire world because they're not able to meet demand for their own people's medicines almost at this point depending on the herb we're talking about so spreading spreading the knowledge spreading the resources rather is, is my biggest point in this and, and that brings us back to empowerment because a lot of these Arabic remedies and what have you is what are in what I like to call the hidden apothecary your kitchen if you stocked a Middle Eastern style Indian kitchen, you can do a lot of this prophetic Islamic stuff without going to the health food store. That I think to me is very important, um, especially you know post pandemic where most of us have experienced, especially practitioners, you know TCM practitioners, Ayurvedic practitioners, when they lost the mail system because of pandemics and what have you. No one was doing deliveries. Practitioners were paralyzed. Whilst I just kept walking into the forest or into my kitchen to make things, and I felt empowered. So. Just something to take away from all this, right? There's there's a lot more to it in that part of the world, and I invite you all to kind of explore it. Yeah, yeah. The more, the merrier. And in terms of you know what information we all have access to together to look at, I think this these yeah. kind of conversations will just push a lot of practice and investigation into different areas that are underexplored. So I'm glad to be helping yeah, facilitate and expand um, these sort of things. Uh, is there any direction? Uh, where you'd like to point people in terms of where they can find you if they're interested in your work or if they're interested in your products. Yeah, or... totally. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm on Instagram, Talal Herbalist. Uh, you can find me on Facebook as well. I'm pretty I'm a pretty unique name, so I'm not hard to miss. Uh, UrbanApothecary.ca is my website. Uh, if you're looking into some of my stuff um, to to look to to purchase or what have you. Um, I do teach a lot, so if anyone's looking to kind of learn from me, learn how to apply some of these Islamic, Arabic, uh, well, I see my, my style basically is, is what I teach, which is a hyper mix. It's almost like Unani 2.0. That's really what I do. I, I've taken Unani and I've inoculated it with a lot of modern day science and some alchemy and created my own system where I can continually measure success, right? So then if, yeah. Awesome. Go, everybody go check them out and thank you so much. Pleasure, dude.